leukemias and lymphomas uh, for testable topics on the USMLE and COMLEX exams. My name is Dr. Joe Hansen. I've been working with med school tutors as an individual tutor for somewhere around five years now. I'm going to use the expertise I've garnered working with hundreds of students for thousands of hours to hopefully give you guys an idea of what's really high yield about this really frustrating topic and set of concepts that they throw onto the test for us. Uh, with me tonight is Dr. Moses Murdoch. Moses, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. As mentioned, my name is Moses Murdoch. I'm also a physician in internal medicine training and hoping to become a hematologist and oncologist like Joe. I've done a ton of tutoring for uh, step one, um, working individually with students as well as mentoring other tutors. And I'm really excited to be here and chat with uh, you all about something that I care about a lot. Awesome. All right. Well, without further ado, as you guys kind of get settled in here, we'll start talking about who we are at Med School Tutors before we launch into our main topic. So just to kind of give you an idea of what Med School Tutors does, typically we work one on one with students online like this uh, to teach students directly about topics and concepts that show up on basically any exam from pre-med all the way up through residency. Typically, we emphasize step and complex exams, but we also work with students towards applying to residency, applying to med school, that type of stuff as well. Uh, we have over 15 years of success in this industry. We've worked with tons of people over this course of time. And as a result, we've also gained a lot of med students, residents, and now attendings that work with us that have done excellent on their exams and matched into incredible institutions. And we're really eager to share our knowledge and whatever wisdom we've garnered here with you guys. And so if you guys are ever looking for somebody to pair up with and work as a mentor or tutor towards whatever you're working on in medical school before or after, feel free to reach out and give us a, a message or two. Uh, we'll give you more about who we are a little bit later on. For now, let's go ahead and pivot over into talking about tonight's topic. So things we're going to cover today are going to be leukemias and lymphomas, and basically how they're going to ask you questions on the USMLE and COMLEX exams, and what are the key points that are easy to overlook, and what are maybe some of the less key points that you are allowed to set off to the side, meaning basically what's important, what's not important when you're looking for these questions on the exam. Along with that, we'll include uh, some high yield tidbits about pathology, as well as some really clear images that demonstrate the stuff that you're likely to see in media-based questions on the exam. And then just some knowledge that we've garnered in terms of what's most likely to show up on the exam as a result. Uh, we'll wrap up this evening by telling you a little bit more about ourselves once again, and then doing a live question and answer at the end. At some point towards the end of our session as well, we've just sent you guys a message with uh, a little bit of a survey in there. If you guys could take a moment at the end of our conversation this evening to kind of give us some feedback in terms of what worked and what didn't, we'd love to hear it. We're always trying to make these more informative, more efficient for you guys when you come and join us for these webinars. So let's go ahead and actually dive into the material for this evening. So Moses, you want to start us off with some general tips about lymphoma, leukemia, and what we're going to see on these exams. Absolutely. So first of all, I want to recognize sort of the elephant in the room, and that is that unlike me, who wants to eventually treat a lot of these diseases, there is an alphabet soup of markers, translocations, pathology images that can sort of blur into each other. The first step when approaching one of these questions is taking a deep breath. We'll, you know that this information, it's stuff that you've seen in your textbooks, preclinically, as well as in your step one preparations, you will be able to answer this, these questions. There will be enough information in the vignette for a medical student, not a pathologist, not a, an attending, but a medical student to answer these questions. So don't be intimidated by the amount of memorization. If possible, try to focus on the logic behind the numbers, the why, not only the what. And then as we will highlight in the next uh, 45 minutes or so, focusing on what is most high yield, what is most commonly tested, will really be hammering those points throughout uh, this webinar. Now, more specifically around hematologic malignancies, trying to create frameworks in your own mind so that you can categorize diseases into buckets. And this will help you because these examinations are multiple choice. And if you can quickly divide the field of possible correct answers in half and in half again, you're basically at a correct answer. So as you see on the slide, there are a couple of ways that you might think about doing that. Remember that the bone marrow is the factory that produces all of the immune cells, many of which can undergo neoplastic transformation and eventually lead to a le uh, leukemia in the blood or a mass, a lymphoma. And you can use your understanding of fundamental hematopoiesis to help start 
clearing the field and figuring out what is going on with the patient in the vignette in front of you. Some of the ways that you can do that is thinking, is this a myeloid disease versus a lymphoid disease? Again, we'll highlight this as we go along. When it comes to the lymphomas, is it an aggressive lymphoma or is it an indolent, more slow growing lymphoma? And we'll link this to the basic science of why some of these lymphomas are rapidly expansile and, and grow very quickly as opposed to being more indolent. I think most med students uh, have heard the distinction between Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's with between you and me, not particularly helpful because it's one disease and then every other lymphoma. Um, but again, this is a classic division that, that you're taught. And then thinking about the demographics, what do you find in that first one line in the vignette? Is it a disease that characteristically affects the very young, those in the middle, those who are very elderly, and sometimes there's a bimodal distribution, in which case you can't rely on it effectively to, to get to the right answer. And again, going back to the leukemia versus lymphoma distinction, some are just one. They, it's just malignant cells floating in the blood throughout the body. Others are mostly just masses on lymphoma that is picked up either on exam or on imaging. And sometimes you can have both. And characteristics of where you find these uh, leukemias and lymphomas in the body can be a clue in certain cases as to what disease you're dealing with. That'll help you then answer the basic science question that is most likely to be tested. Joe, anything to add to that? Uh, I'll simply say that when we give these characteristics, in particular when we're talking about age demographics, for instance, these can be really useful to kind of help you out on the exam. For instance, we might say that like acute lymphoblastic lymphoma is most common, the most commonly found uh, leukemia that we're gonna find in children. That doesn't necessarily mean that every single child you see has that specific diagnosis though. So you wanna be careful here that some things will be hard and fixed like certain translocations that can only happen with specific conditions, but other things are gonna be kind of general indicators. And with everything else on the exam for US and million complex, demographic information is helpful, but sometimes can be abrogated. You can break those rules in order to make a diagnosis. And just keep that in mind as we're kind of giving you the rules this evening. Not all of these are gonna be hard and fixed in stone. Cool, uh, so Moses, uh, keep us going. Uh, tell us about the general structure of what we're gonna find with leukemias. Perfect. So I alluded to earlier this distinction uh, between leukemias and lymphomas, again, the OMA being the mass versus the leukemia being in the blood. The big distinction that we think about first is whether it's of a myeloid lineage. And again, when we're thinking about myeloid, the most common in non-malignant situations are things like neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils, that lineage versus lymphoid, which is really B cells and T cells that then become neoplastic. The next point I wanna make is that within each of those subdivisions, you have acute leukemias and you have more chronic leukemias. Now, it, sometimes this can be confusing because the word acute and the word chronic sometimes can be used to refer to the time course of an illness. Acute being something that occurs very rapidly in terms of the time course and chronic something that develops over the course of weeks or months. I wanna be very clear, this is not necessarily what we're talking about when we're talking about these leukemias. Remember that for a cell to become neoplastic, it must become deranged. It's not listening to the signals that the body has in place to control its growth within normal parameters, normal health. The block in differentiation or the neoplastic step can have very early in the path from a stem cell in the bone marrow to a fully differentiated uh, cell in the blood. In an acute leukemia, whether myeloid or lymphoid, that block in differentiation occurs relatively early, so closer to the hematopoietic stem cell. And you can see that in the pathology, which we'll show in the slides ahead. The cells look very blast-like. They look very undifferentiated. In contrast, chronic refers to uh, malignancies that, uh, where the block or the neoplastic transformation occurs later, closer to the more differentiated uh, state. Within myeloid and lymphoid malignancies, you see listed here some of the diseases that we will talk about over the course of our time. And uh, with that, I think we should just go ahead and get started with our first disease. And I'm being greedy by hogging all of the leukemias because of course it's something that's very near and dear to my heart. I promise Joe, I'll give you a chance to, to share your wisdom and knowledge here in a that's second. Okay. I'll, I I'll butt in from time to time too. So I'll, I'll get my words in edgewise, don't worry. Amazing. Uh, with that, I'll start off by talking about 
the first leukemia, which is the acute promyelocytic leukemia. So the way that we're gonna generally present these diseases is broken up into two parts. The first is how does it present? In other words, what in the vignette will lead you to suspect that this is the diagnosis that is being tested. Um, in the case of acute promyelocytic leukemia, which is a myeloid leukemia, so and it's acute, which means that the block occurs very early, the major presentations from a clinical standpoint will be the complications and the results of the cytopenias that result from a bone marrow that is too busy making leukemia cells and not busy enough making the cells that the body needs to function normally. So you might see uh, the effects of thrombocytopenia, things like petechiae, things like bleeding complications. Because these neoplastic cells are basically not interested in defending the body against infection, they're too busy replicating and being dysfunctional, you can see infectious complications from either a true or a functional neutropenia. So either there's not enough uh, normal neutrophils to fight off any infection that might come the body's way, or you have enough neutrophils, but they're just not acting quite right. They're not carrying out their expected functions. And lastly, you can have the effects of anemias, things like fatigue, pallor, that result when the bone marrow isn't working quite right. Now, let's take a step back and say that acute promyelocytic leukemia is a subset of acute myeloid leukemia. I we titled this slide acute promyelocytic leukemia because it's honestly the most often tested acute myeloid leukemia. So acute myeloid leukemia, big bucket, bunch of different subtypes that as a med student and for these examinations, you don't necessarily need to worry about. The one that you really need to uh, focus most of your attention on, the most commonly tested, is the APL or APML subtype of acute myeloid leukemia. One of the unique uh, clinical presentations of acute promyelocytic leukemia is that it can present with DIC. So again, like a, a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia sort of picture, the coags are out of whack, you might see renal injury outside of the scope a little bit of the topic of, of this webinar, but it can be seen with acute promyelocytic leukemia. Now, what are you going to be tested on in your examinations? The most common is the translocation, T1517, PML, RAR alpha. This is just pathognomonic for this disease. And it's honestly pretty frequently tested. The treatment actually stems directly from this translocation because all transretinoic acid actually has a uh, binding and affects the PML RAR alpha fusion protein, releasing the block on differentiation and essentially curing the disease. It's one of the great success stories in oncology. The fact that arsenic trioxide is added to this regimen, not super important. Atra is what you need to remember. And lastly, it's this picture that you see on the right. What you're really looking for is one, uh, very blast-like, non-differentiated cells. So what are you looking for there? Large nuclei, large N to C ratio, right? Maybe some granules. But then the key that will really cinch this diagnosis for you is the presence of our rods, which are these long, thin uh, fibrils inside the cytoplasm of the cell that are made up of myeloperoxidase, which is key because often these cells are so de-differentiated. You can't actually tell if they're myeloid or lymphoid, but if you see our rods, especially on these examinations, case closed. You're dealing with a case of acute promyelocytic leukemia, likely, but definitely within the myeloid uh, lineage. Anything to add there, Joe? All right, so I'm gonna jump in. I'm gonna add a little bit to context uh, what Moses had said here. So it's fun watching Moses talk about this because I'm slowly seeing him turn into one of those old professors that you see in the front of the class for MS1 and MS2 because he knows <laughs> so much about this stuff. I wanna provide some context to what Moses had said and kind of like layer this how, I would anticipate some of you might be looking at this right now and saying, well, maybe some of this language doesn't make so much sense. So. I wanna be clear that Moses said this expertly, but the raw, raw thing we're talking about here is a retinoic acid receptor. So it makes a lot of sense that retinoic acid would bind to it. So when we're saying raw, raw there, or RAR alpha, we're saying the retinoic acid receptor alpha, and that means that that treatment is specific to this particular diagnosis, which means that you cannot use this for any other leukemia, which 
would then mean that identifying APML specifically is really important because now you know what you can use to treat it. Specifically though, this translocation, this treatment is specific to APML as opposed to the AML, which is the super category that this falls under. But good news, there's no other unique stuff about AMLs other than APML that shows up on the test. So for you, AML and APML mean the same thing. So if anybody says acute myelocytic leukemia, acute promyelocytic leukemia, it's all the same. They're almost certainly going to be asking about a 1517 translocation, this fusion protein product, and retinoic acid. Now, it's possible they could give you a question about AML that's not APML, but they would never try to trick you by like throwing the 1517 translocation and saying, oh, like, is this correct for the non-APML types? So for all intents and purposes, you might as well think of this as being the version of AML that you will see on the exam. Also, I wanna go back just a little bit and talk about some of the presenting findings that you would see with this condition. I wanna emphasize that as far as questions go on the USMLE exam, these findings are actually relatively non-specific for leukemia, any condition that's going to wipe out the functional bone marrow. And the main issue with leukemia is that's arising from the bone marrow, whether it's AML or ALL or any other kind of leukemia, the bone marrow functionally doesn't work anymore because you have cancer spreading in the bone marrow and preventing the formation of normal red blood cells, normal platelets, and normal white blood cells. Now we only have the diseased white blood cells that Moses said were uninterested in fighting infection and only interested in duplicating themselves. However, DIC does not happen with pretty much any other leukemia, at least not with any frequency that would be respected by the exam. And so if you see somebody who looks like they have leukemia and DIC at the same time, there you go. That's your answer is probably AML. So to clarify, Pretty much any leukemia will demonstrate with these clinical symptoms to the point where many questions on the exam will start by saying, you have a patient presenting with gum bleeding, easy bruising, pallor, fatigue on exertion, and these just repetitive infections that seem to last for a long time and sometimes require antibiotics, implying a deficiency of red blood cells, a deficiency of platelets, and a deficiency of functional white blood cells. And that's kind of a universal leukemia thing. Then you add in the extra special, special spices here, which is going to be the translocation or the DIC or the hour rods, which are going to be the things that show you specifically that we're looking at this leukemia. And I bring all of this up to emphasize that there are other leukemias that you must know, including chronic myeloid leukemia, CML. Now, the trick here is that we will typically find that a lot of patients initially are asymptomatic as they're developing CML, but that doesn't mean that they cannot eventually develop the other symptoms that are always seen in leukemia. And so the question becomes whether or not you're going to find a patient who is identified specifically because they have a tremendously high white blood cell count, or if they have some of the other markers of leukemia, which is going to be anemia, thrombocytopenia, and repetitive infections. Even though they have 100,000 white blood cells, which is through the roof, doesn't mean that those white blood cells do anything, which means that you could still develop repetitive infections in this condition. So you'll notice that I typed into the chat a minute ago. I'm going to try to engage you guys a little bit. So uh, bear with me here, kind of play along with me. I'm going to ask you guys a question, and I'd like you to do your best to try to supply an answer into the chat box to Moses and to myself uh, based on what I'm asking here. So we get some interaction here. Don't have to supply an answer, but if you know the answer, I'd really like you to throw it my way. If we have this particular leukemia, CML, we have a really, really high white blood cell count, and we have this really, really low LAP score. Can you guys tell me what other condition, not leukemia, would give me a really high white blood cell count, more than 50,000, but would give me a normal or high LAP score? Can anybody tell me what that condition would be that commonly masquerades as CML in questions that we're seeing? Okay, I got a couple of people answering already. Ooh, very good. All right, you guys are ready to go tonight. I love it. So got a couple answers that came in, all correct. Excellent, another one, leukemoid reaction. Cool, all right, cool, you guys are doing great. Thank you so much for the answers, appreciate it. So leukemoid reaction is a condition where we just have a hyperplastic response to some kind of infectious etiology, but it's not leukemia because it's functional white blood cells we're making. How do we know they're functional? They produce all the enzymes that normal white blood cells do, including leukocyte alkaline phosphatase, which is that LAP score. So one way that you can easily determine whether you have 
good functional white blood cells or not good cancerous, just interested in duplicating white blood cells would be by measuring the LAP score. And I'm gonna argue that any question you see on the exam, maybe 90% of the time, if you see white blood cells greater than 50,000, you're basically down to two answer choices. Am I looking at the leukemoid reaction or am I looking at CML? And the way that you would be able to determine that is by looking at the LAP score. And based on the other clinical findings in the question, you might be forced to determine whether it's leukemoid or CML. And then one of the answer choices might be like high or low LAP. So one that they really like to test on. They usually don't show images for LAP itself. You usually stain for it, but you have to know what the test is because they love asking about that one. I'll further uh, add to that by saying that generally speaking, there is a translocation in CML. And I meant to say this a moment ago too, but just to clarify for anybody who is at my speed when I was in MS2, translocation means that we're taking two chromosomes and just slamming them together. So chromosome nine and 22 are now one mega chromosome. And that happens specifically in this condition. If you ever see a 922 uh, translocation, you know you're looking at CML. And if you see CML, you know it's got to have that 922 translocation, which is a combination of BCR and APL. So the things that we can use to treat this would include imatinib and disatinib. Imatinib is the main one that they're usually going to ask about on the exam. We kind of do need to know that therapy, especially for step two questions. Uh, anything to add to the CML stuff, Moses? The only thing I would really highlight is that if we didn't give you the clinical background, if we didn't give you the laboratory uh, studies, and we just handed you a slide and looked under it, it wouldn't immediately be obvious whether there is a leukemia, leukemic process going on in the first place. That's the whole point of the LAP. Now, granted, to even get to a leukemoid reaction, what, what do you need? You need an infection usually that is extremely severe. So just to be very concrete about this, because I benefited from thinking of specific clinical cases, if you have a patient with extremely severe C. diff infection and their white count is super high, or they have a rip roaring abscess somewhere or a pneumonia with an empyema, the body's response to that extreme sort of infectious state will be to mount an extremely high white count. Um, but of course you would not see the translocation. The LAP would be high um, and that would really help you distinguish. Someone who just has the clinical syndrome that stems from their bone marrow not working, but no other localizing signs of infections and a white count above 100, that again sort of pushes you slightly in the direction of a leukemic process. In the context of these examinations though, they'll give you enough information to make that distinction. Awesome, um, I'll say one more thing, even though the image is not immediately shouting at us that we have CML, the way that you would anticipate that our rods would just be an instantaneous pathognomonic answer for you for AML. Nevertheless, you can kind of get the sense there's a lot of white blood cells in this image. You can also assess that simply by looking at the CBC. They'll likely give you lab values to that end. But also, as I look at this, there are a couple of cells that don't look like they have the typical shape of a white blood cell, I meaning they have a relatively large nucleus. And Moses mentioned this before, but typically blast cells in the, in the bloodstream at all are going to indicate that we have some kind of malignant process occurring. You really should not see baby white blood cells. And the definition of a baby white blood cell would be one that has a massive nucleus relative to the cytoplasm. So if it's basically all nucleus that we're seeing inside the cell, that high nucleus to cytoplasm ratio implies that we have a very, very immature white blood cell. And the more that you see of immature white blood cells, the more indication that we have a pathological proliferation of immature white blood cells. More to the point though, any blast cells ever usually indicates that we're looking at leukemia on the exam. All right, so moving on from AML, CML, uh, Moses, do you want to go ahead and take us through myeloproliferative neoplasms? Sure thing. So up until now, we've really focused on the white cells in terms of how they can present with a leukemic picture. Myeloproliferative neoplasms shift the focus a little bit away from the white cells and to the other two major lineage, uh, lineages within the myeloid compartment. Namely, you, we're talking here about red blood cells platelets, and then of course the bone marrow itself. So we're gonna walk through these each at a time, but 
big picture what's going on here is that we have a neoplastic process, a clonal process that presents primarily, at least by the way these diseases are named, by abnormalities in the red cells and the platelets, as well as fibrosis of the marrow. So PV stands for polycythemia vera, primary polycythemia. Um, it presents with a very high red blood cell count. So usually in clinical practice, we worry about people being anemic, whether they're bleeding, hemolyzing, not producing enough. But in this case, it's actually an overproduction of, uh, of red blood cells. Um, and from a clinical standpoint, uh, you can have aquagenic pruritus, which is basically they take a hot shower, there's histamine release, um, and it leads to this presentation of aquagenic pruritus, some itchy feeling, and then erythromyalgia, again, pain, redness associated with, um, uh, with having a very high red blood cell count. One point I'll make about polycythemia vera is that you can have a, white a high red blood cell count for lots of reasons. If you took me from Boston and dumped me in Denver, you know, my, my red blood cell count would go up, but that would be an appropriate increase um, that is dependent on me, my body wanting to get sufficient oxygen carrying capacity to deal with the change in altitude. Again, I want to engage uh, you all and get you as active in this process as possible. What hormone could I test to see if um, this uh, response in a patient's elevated red blood cell count is due to hypoxia versus some other process? What, what hormone could I, be, could I be looking for? Yeah, exactly. So erythropoietin, remember that's the body's signal to the bone marrow, hey, make more red blood cells. We need more oxygen carrying capacity. That is not the case with polycythemia vera. This is neoplastic. It's not responding to any environmental signal. So again, with polycythemia vera, predominantly the issue here is high red blood cells. You can have these other clinical findings. EPO would not be driving this process. ET is the uh, version of this, but with platelets, essential thrombocythemia, high platelets. But the key here is that the platelets are not functioning normally because you would think, hmm, if the platelets are high, why are you writing that they're bleeding? They have more than enough platelets to deal with bleeding. But the key is that these platelets are not quite normal. And in fact, when you get to super, super high platelet counts, as you can see with essential thrombocythemia, you can have both issues with bleeding and thrombosis, sometimes not in the same patient, but certainly in this disease, you could end up with both. Um, and the clinical manifestations otherwise uh, would be pretty similar. And then you have this entity of primary myelofibrosis, MF, that's what it stands for, myelofibrosis. And as the name implies, there's no mystery here. Um, there is marrow fibrosis. You can see in that top right picture, um, an example of the reticulin fibers that are stained. You don't need to remember that necessarily for, for step one, but just to give you a visual sort of sense of what that looks like. And patients can also have splenomegaly. At the very bottom of the slide, I, I've mentioned that even though these diseases are named for a particular lineage in the case of PV and ET, polycythemia vera, essential thrombocytes, um, you can have mild or even more severe uh, elevations in other, in other cell lineages. So in polycythemia vera, you can have elevations in white count. You can also have elevations in platelets. In essential thrombocythemia, it's a little bit more restricted. Usually it's just abnormalities of the platelets. And in myelofibrosis, again, because it's, it's a fibrotic state, you tend to have lower white uh, counts um, as compared with the other diseases. Now, here's what you're gonna be tested on. The genetics of each of these three diseases, the one that they're gonna test you on is the JAK2 V617F variant. So that's something you should definitely commit to memory because if any of these three diseases are gonna be tested, that's what's gonna be uh, likely to be tested. The other thing is that in myelofibrosis specifically, the cells that are being created try to sneak out of the bone marrow, but they're having to get through this jungle gym of fibrosis. And so as they do that, the cells, particularly the red cells, they can get deformed and you can end up with teardrop cells. Sometimes they're called dacrocytes. And an image of that is shown in the lower right-hand side of the slide. So big picture again, this is a neoplastic process, myeloid compartment, focusing in, at least naming convention-wise, on the red cells and on the platelets 
JAK2V617F is the uh, genetic abnormality to remember. Um, there's a few of these more unique presentations like the aquagenic pruritus and erythromalalgia that uh, might show up in the vignette as well. Joe, all you, anything to add? Okay, um, only this, uh, I have a little tip that could show up on the exam that I think is kind of useful if you have heard this before. So we talked about the JAK2 mutation here and I wanna emphasize the reason that we call that JAK2 is that it's an abbreviation for Yanis kinase. Yanis, like the James Bond villain, if you guys are old enough to know about that James Bond villain, uh, and or I guess uh, Jupiter, the god from Greek mythology or whatever. But Yanis kinase, the idea here is that we named this kinase JAK. I want you to know that because you're going to come into encounter questions later on, I imagine, that will talk about how you stimulate the bone marrow and what kind of pathways you're going to use to cause proliferation of these cells. I want to realize that Yanis kinase is going to be a non-receptor tyrosine kinase. Now that might sound like a large set of words right now, but hopefully I'll start to coalesce later on. That means that anything is there, whether we're telling the platelets to proliferate, whether we're telling white blood cells to proliferate, specifically neutrophils if we're using granulocyte -like colony stimulating factor, or if we're telling red blood cells to proliferate, we're using a non-receptor tyrosine kinase to do that. So all stimulants of the bone marrow, for the most part, at least on the exam, are gonna be non-receptor tyrosine kinase and JAK stands for yes kinase. All right, cool, excellent job walking us through some pretty tricky stuff, one of my least favorite topics on the exam. So I'm glad you covered that one and I will safely land with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which is, I think, a little bit more friendly. So. We've talked so far about these kind of myelocytic leukemias, these myeloid leukemias that generally come from the primordial precursors to neutrophils and a lot of other stuff that the bone marrow makes. Now we're going to pivot over to the other type of white blood cell. The two major pathway breakdowns that we have here for white blood cells are, are they going to be myelocytic or are they going to be lymphoid lymphoblastic? So now we're looking at kind of like the lymphocytic side of things on the bone marrow. Keep in mind, B cells and T cells are gonna be our major lymphocytes. And those guys are going to arise in the bone marrow. And then they are going to migrate over to the lymph nodes or maybe the thymus in the case of T cells, but they still start in the bone marrow. So if you have a mutation in the kind of early lymphoid cells before they've left the bone marrow, then you can develop cancer in the bone marrow and we can develop uh, leukemia in that case. Keep in mind, much later on, we're talking about B cells that are in lymph nodes. Eventually you can develop lymphomas from those guys, but they would have had to already have gone to the lymph node first before undergoing malignant transformation for them to be lymphomas in that case. So lymphoblastic leukemias, the early lymphoid cells before they leave the bone marrow, they turn to cancer. So generally speaking, when we're looking at ALL, it's generally by and large gonna be in younger people. It's the most common leukemia that you're gonna find in children and the test likes to emphasize a five-year-old coming in with ALL, for instance, uh, specifically if it's a B cell ALL. Now keep in mind, if we're looking at acute lymphoblastic leukemia, the precursor cells could be of the B cell lineage or the T cell lineage. So now you have B cell ALL and T cell ALL to consider if we're really getting specific about what type we're looking at. Now, happily, it's pretty easy to recognize a T cell, ALL, because those T cells will go migrate to the thymus and cause a massive mediastinal mass as a thymoma. That will not happen with B cells. So the presence of a thymoma is proof positive that you're probably looking at T cells if you already know that you have ALL. And the absence of that thymoma kind of indicates a B cell, ALL, in that case. Now I'll point out, this will present as the same stuff that we talked about with myeloid leukemia. It's still leukemia. You're still gonna have the bone marrow filling up with these inappropriate white blood cells. So you're gonna have kids presenting with easy bruising, pallor, fatigue, and repetitive infections. And on the CBC, you would see low red blood cells, low platelets, and likely pretty high white blood cells, even if it's not up to the level that you typically see in CML, even if it's not like greater than 50,000 level that we usually see. So what we usually will do to prove this is we will do a biopsy of the bone marrow. And what we're looking at in the image here is the bone marrow jam packed with blast cells. Now you're supposed to find blast cells in the bone marrow. So this is kind of a fine line if you're looking at this on the exam and you see an image like this, 
the normal bone marrow has a healthy balance between kind of fatty tissue and actual white blood cells. If all you can see all around is white blood cells, these gigantic nucleus cells inside the bone marrow, that probably means you have leukemia, specifically usually lymphoblastic leukemia. But better ways to test this than just by eyeballing it, we can use markers. So we have a couple major markers that we're going to use, specifically TDT, terminal deoxyribonucleotidyl transferase. Ugh, like they do write it out on the exam, unfortunately, sometimes. Uh, if you see that, that means that you got ALL of some sort. Now you don't know if it's T cell or B cell ALL, so then we use the CD markers. Now remember, CD10 might generally recommend, be recognized in basically any ALL that we look at, but for the most part, if we're looking at T cells, remember those guys are supposed to be CD4 and CD8 as adults. So if you see a CD marker that's close to CD4 or CD8, like CD5, right between the two of them, that's probably a T, C, T cell ALL. If you're looking at B cells, B cells are CD20. So if you see a CD marker that's around that number, CD19, for instance, then you know you're looking at a B cell ALL. So we can kind of cheat the system here and use the CD markers to our advantage. But the TDT specifically is going to be the thing that tells you that this is ALL and not AML or something else. Um, also, there is a translocation associated with this one, which is going to make it much more likely for this to be easily treated. However, I'm going to point out that that's not commonly asked on the exam. And if we're looking at like the bare bones list of translocations to know, it's okay if we kind of like don't memorize that one, unlike the translocations for AML and CML, which are extremely important. Uh, anything to add about that, Moses? On the theme of things that you don't necessarily need to know is the treatments uh, for some of these leukemias and lymphomas. I will, we will highlight along the way which of the treatments is, are commonly tested and which are not. The treatment for ALL is complicated. There's a bunch of really long acronyms with like six or seven drugs given at the same time. Just purge it from your mind. Don't worry about it. It's not tested on step one or complex. Um, so I would not worry about it. The one case where I can see folks um, testing uh, the markers as they relate to therapy is precisely what Joe had mentioned. If it's a B cell AL, uh, ALL and it has CD20 on it in the chat, what do you imagine? What drug specifically targets CD20 that we might use in the treatment of ALL? And already folks are putting in the chat the monoclonal antibody rituximab. I'll quickly also make a plug for um, uh, a JAK2 inhibitor, which we neglected to mention when talking about the myeloproliferative neoplasms. There is actually a JAK1-2 inhibitor it's called ruxolitinib. So now there's two uh, drugs that start with R that could be tested with respect to the diseases uh, that we have just now mentioned. The first is ruxolitinib, which is a JAK1-2 inhibitor, and rituximab, which is relevant to the slide in front of us, and that is for the treatment of certain BALLs. Every other treatment, we're not even gonna talk about it. It's not important for you. Excellent. I was about to say, I agree. There's absolutely nothing they could ask about the therapy specifically for ALL. They may ask about, you know, mechanistics of certain chemotherapy agents and things like that. That's step one appropriate. But even for step two, chemotherapy regimen, not on the exam. However, then you reminded me, rituximab is actually fair game in terms of its mechanism of action, which is going to be the uh, direct monoclonal antibody against CD20. So you guys definitely should know that one. Uh, there's a question in the chat about the mediastinal mass uh, that we can end up seeing when we see T-A-L-L, specifically whether or not this is actually the thymus. Now, maybe Moses can correct me on this, but for all intents and purposes, as far as the exam goes, yes, you might as well think of this as a thymoma. That's the easiest way to connect these dots in our mind. More or less, this is a thymoma, and you're going to find that uh, ALL is one of the common causes of an anterior mediastinal mass if they ever ask you about that at any exam going forward in the future. Uh, so you can see that on x-ray or on CT scan, uh, usually pretty, thank you, all right, cool, and uh, usually pretty clear here because uh, while the thymus is usually visible in neonates and young children on x-ray, you can commonly get what's called a sale sign where you can see this kind of triangular thymus there. You really shouldn't be the thymus uh, taking up all this space and taking away the cardiac contours. And so this in the presence of leukemia findings or a CBC that indicates they have leukemia more or less guarantees that we're looking at T-cell ALL. So 
with that, I'll hand it over to you, Moses, to talk about the partner to ALL, the other lymphocytic leukemia, which would be chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Awesome. So just to keep orienting you all, we just finished talking about the myeloid acute and chronic leukemias, and now we're wrapping up the uh, lymphoid leukemias by talking about the chronic form of lymphocytic leukemia. So again, chronic refers to the stage of differentiation of, of these leukemic cells. Um, here, the demographics tend to be older folks. This is a very slowly progressing leukemia. Often these folks are observed for years um, before any treatment is initiated. The one feared complication that you might run into is something called a Richter transformation in which uh, the CLL, sometimes known as SLL, transforms into DLBCL, which we will talk about later. So not much to worry about there. The other clinical association is with an autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So AIHA. Those are the key things you need to know for the exam. Someone in the chat earlier put in uh, a comment about smudge cells. Those are the cells at the bottom right of the slide. I think having a little bit of a visual image of how these smudge cells occur, you know, when you're preparing uh, the slide, you have a drop of blood, you're spreading it with the, with the slide, these cells are a little bit fragile, and so they deform, and they take uh, the appearance that they've been smudged or smeared across the slide. And really, I'm just uh, completing the alley-oop here from Joe, because he already gave us the primer on how to think about some of these markers, CD4, CD8, CD3, that's T-cell stuff. Here, this is most commonly a B cell issue. And we know that because it's CD5 and CD20 positive, CD23 positive. Um, again, will you be, if you see something CD20 positive, can you 100% say that it is CLL? No, there's many things that are uh, CD20 positive because they're expressed on most, if not all, B cells. But the combination of older age, some of these other clinical features, maybe they'll show you a smudge cell and you have evidence of uh, this B cell process, um, that's when you can uh, be thinking more about CLL. All right, excellent. So we've gone through the four major categories of leukemia. So again, we're looking at myeloid versus lymphoblast lymphocytic, and then we're looking at acute versus chronic. And then I'm gonna add on one more here, which is gonna be kind of like the special random flavor, which is hairy cell leukemia. Now, to me, personally, hairy cell leukemia is kind of a bonus leukemia because, to me, it does not fall under any of the normal description that we gave for the other types of leukemia up until this point. Specifically, the main thing that hairy cell leukemia is going to have that other leukemias do not is that on biopsy of the bone marrow, you're going to find nothing in there. So when you do your biopsy, you basically just suck out some kind of adipose fatty tissue and you don't see any white blood cells, red blood cells, or platelets, which is a little peculiar because leukemias, by and large, are going to be the hyperproliferation of white blood cells, which you would imagine would mean that you'd have a lot of them inside the bone marrow. So it doesn't really add up in that regard. And so for that reason, we're going to find that we have very little white blood cells in the bone marrow uh, when we're looking at hairy cell leukemia, and that's its unique feature. The other unique feature that we're going to find is that when you find them in the peripheral smear, so when you see white blood cells, when you take a blood draw and you just look at their blood, you end up seeing these hairy projections emanating from the cell where the cytoplasm has all of these like little fine kind of like fimbriae that kind of come off with the cell membrane. And so that particular finding gives us the name hairy cell leukemia, and predominantly, the other major thing you're going to find here is not only do you get bone marrow fibrosis, but you also get really large splenomegaly in these individuals. Finally, the test question they'll typically ask is how you might prove that you have this condition. And trap staining is going to do that. Tartrate resistant acid phosphatase basically means that most cells will wash out with this tartrate or with this acid phosphatase stain, but it will not remove the stain with tartrate the way that you're supposed to. Tartrate resistant is the idea there. Point being that you just have to remember the acronym TRAP, it's TRAP positive. Uh, other than that, we do have a couple of treatments that are predominantly going to be used for hairy cell leukemia. I'll point out that the likelihood of them asking you about cladribine specifically or pentastatin on the exam is pretty low. You probably don't need to specifically uh, memorize any specific treatments for these conditions. So I'd instead emphasize TRAP positivity, 
as well as that dry tap on bone marrow as being clear indicators that were outside the realm of our typical leukemias. If the only thing I'll question. add uh, quickly is that, remember when we talked about myelofibrosis, um, we talked about the dacrocyte, the tear cell. And in this picture, you can actually see a sort of a lonely uh, teardrop looking cell in the middle of the slide. And the, the physiology of that is, is very similar to myelofibrosis, trying to squeeze out of um, an abnormal bone marrow. And then I'll just address one question that was in the chat. Someone asked uh, about different CD markers. Let me start by saying TRAP is really the one you should be focusing on. Yes, it's positive for other B cell markers. There is like CD103. Uh, that is uh, really an advanced pathology sort of hematology thing. Um, I, I would be very, I would think it would be very unlikely for that ever to show up on step one or on complex. All right, so let's move on from our leukemias here and start talking about the lymphomas. Uh, so before I hand it over to you, Moses, I'll just say, Moses already mentioned something really important about our kind of terminology here. Lymphoma implies that we have a mass of some sort that we are palpating in the patient. Oma, usually referring to some kind of tumor or mass, which means, generally speaking, lymphomas are going to be really, really enlarged lymph nodes that have lots and lots of cancerous proliferative white blood cells in them. And lymph nodes are known for having lots of B cells in them. And so generally speaking, what we're going to find is a lot of B cell lymphomas. T cells are also going to be interacting with B cells in germinal centers. And so you can have T cell lymphomas as well. But lymph nodes generally contain lymphocytes, and a lymphoma, therefore, would be a tumor of lymph nodes. And so Moses did a great job of laying that out before, that unlike the kind of liquid nature of leukemia, where you have white blood cells all over the bloodstream, here we have a tumor in the lymph nodes, which means it probably came from lymphocytes. So we're not really as concerned about discussing the myeloid cells at all anymore, because they don't really take up residence in the lymph nodes. And as a result, we're not really looking for any kind of myeloid cancers in this case. We're now relegated to looking at B or T cells. So uh, with that, Moses, I'll hand it over to you. Tell us a little bit more about these B and T cell lymphomas. Absolutely. And I think I, I sort of gave a, a preview on this earlier when it came to thinking about the major subdivisions of lymphomas. Classically, you uh, would think about something like the Hodgkin versus non-Hodgkin lymphoma as the major division point. And then you're thinking about whether it is an aggressive or an indolent lymphoma. Now, something that can be a little confusing, but I'll try to explain here is that when we talk about aggressive and indolent, we're not necessarily talking about um, the prognosis because often the aggressive lymphomas are more treatable. You can think of it as the uh, lymphoma cells are replicating so quickly, so rapidly that the chemo is extremely effective at them because the mechanism of a lot of chemotherapy is targeted towards actively dividing cells, either through like alkylating agents, or perhaps it's mimicking a nucleotide or nucleoside, and therefore disrupting DNA replication. And it is those more aggressive lymphomas that are often more often treatable by conventional chemotherapies. Whereas the undulant lymphomas, they grow so slowly, it's hard for the chemo to really effectively uh, attack it and kill those cells. And so um, that is the major division of, uh, of lymphomas. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Joe to talk about Hodgkin. All right, so Hodgkin's lymphoma is gonna be a whole branch of lymphomas. As Moses was mentioning, the very first question you're gonna ask yourself when you see a lymphoma on the exam is, is it Hodgkin's or is it non-Hodgkin's? So we have Hodgkin's lymphoma under which there are many different subtypes. And then we have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which also has a bunch of subtypes. Here's the big takeaway though. The subtypes for Hodgkin's lymphoma, and Moses will cringe, don't matter. <laughs> they do not matter for the exams that you'll be taking. The USMLE exams, the complex exams will not ask you more than like a single question in all of your world about the subtypes of Hodgkin's lymphoma. So for all intents and purposes, you can treat this as a monolithic disorder, the same way that we treat AML as a monolithic disorder, even though there's subtypes of AML that we might care about. 
So how do we know if we have Hodgkin's? How do I know if I just have this condition or whether I have to go through the exhaustive process of figuring out that it's a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, what type it is and what translocation it has? Hodgkin's lymphoma are always going to have these Reed Sternberg cells. If you see the owl eye nuclei pointing back at you from a lymph node, that's it, game over. You're looking at Hodgkin's lymphoma. And what they might ask you is that very commonly we see CD15 and CD30 on their surface. So you kind of have to remember those numbers in regard to this. Other than that, I would point out that this would be one of those conditions that Moses described earlier as bimodal, which means you cannot lock this down as likely being younger people or older people because it actually presents in younger and in older people. There's a period of time in life where it's less likely to show up in middle adulthood, but that doesn't really help you on the exam because you're looking for the specific age that this shows up. So you shouldn't be surprised to find that like a 20 year old has this or a 59 year old because there's a bimodal distribution where I might not be hitting the exact time range here if you look at the graph specifically, but basically young adulthood versus older adulthood is where you're going to see this most commonly. So keep in mind, there are conditions like this that are going to show up at two time points. So big takeaway is if you biopsy the lymph node, you see the Reed Sternberg cell, just say Hodgkin's lymphoma, CD15, CD30. I will point out that Hodgkin's lymphoma is like the poster child for B symptoms, meaning a person who comes in and says, I don't know, I just kind of feel bad. Like I'm sweating at night all the time. I'm losing weight unintentionally. I checked my temperature and for the last two weeks I've had a very mild fever and I just can't really seem to kick what I presume to be an upper respiratory illness, which then turns out to be something far more serious. So these kind of B symptoms are hard to notice, hard to recognize and generally treated as kind of not that important by patients, but can be important for you to identify that we should be looking for a chronic inflammatory process and basically any question asked about Hodgkin's will include those B symptoms. Um, let's see, anything else to add about Hodgkin's lymphoma that I didn't throw in there, Moses? No, I think you covered that really nicely. I think so, for some folks and including for myself, um, the slides haven't advanced since Harry cell leukemia. I don't know if that's an error on Zoom part or something that uh, you could handle on your end, oh, Joe. There we, there go. we go. I'm sorry Perfect. about that. Let me, let me know if that happens again. That seems to have inadvertently got stuck. It now, it now looks great. I would just really emphasize, really know the Reed Sternberg cells. The subtypes are not, uh, are not that important. They're in first aid, but far less likely to be tested than, um, than the Reed Sternberg cells. And I'll also note, again, just to emphasize this again, that in the actual mass of the lymphoma, the actual neoplastic Reed Sternberg cell, the CD1530 positive cell, is actually a minority of the total mass of the tissue. Interesting little, little factoid there. But I'll restrain myself and we can talk about uh, the, next, the next lymphoma. Let's go ahead and move on to Burkitt's and I'll toss it back to you, Moses. Perfect. So Burkitt lymphoma, this is one of the very aggressive, fast-growing lymphomas. Um, it tends to be a, a disease of young adults, although again, I wouldn't really uh, pin your answer based on the demographics in this case. As Joe was mentioning, these B symptoms, the, the inflammatory clinical correlates um, that go along with the lymphoma, the fatigue, um, et cetera, all of this uh, is common across all of the different lymphomas. So again, not something that you would hang your head on to make the diagnosis. For Burkitt's in particular, there's a couple of different variants. You have the, the jaw predominant. There's a picture in first day that's, that's pretty dramatic, the endemic African form of, of the lympho Burkitt's lymphoma. And then uh, when it's found in the pelvis or abdomen, it's more sporadic. But here is where we get into the alphabet soup of translocations, because this is the first of several that we're going to cover. Here you have a translocation between 8 and 14, which involves c -MIC and the IGH heavy chain. Now, I like to remember this particular translocation and particularly the involvement of c um, because MIC is a pro-growth uh, molecule. It's a pro-growth protein. And when it's dysregulated, in other words, when, it's when the chromosomes are smashed together and you have c -MIC that's being, its expression, its activity is being driven by the highly strongly uh, 
promoted uh, region that's linked to it, the immunoglobulin heavy chain, you have a ton of this pro-growth signal going on in these cells. And that actually leads directly into the pathology, the quote, starry sky pathology. And why is that? It's because these lymphoma cells are so, um, they're, they're, they're proliferating so quickly that they're die some, of the, the, some of that population is dying off. And you have these tingible body macrophages that are coming in and they're gobbling up in a, in, a, in a very sort of infectious disease-like way where you're uh, gobbling these things up by the macrophages. Um, and that's the stars in the starry sky. The dark background is the darkly blue staining Burkitt lymphoma cells. Um, like several lymphomas, it's driven and associated with a particular virus, um, which is EBV. Uh, and that's another good thing to know. So again, know the translocation, know it's aggressive, the starry sky, they might show you an image, they might just say uh, and describe the pathology. Um, but again, with many of these lymphomas, you don't have to worry about treatment at all. I'll keep reiterating that, don't waste your time. All right, excellent. Um, so I learned something there. I knew about the starry sky appearance, but not exactly why the macrophages were in there. And so now I'm kind of picking that up here. So I'll point that out to everybody. You will continue to learn forever, <laughs> especially if you're talking to Moses. So um, I just wanna emphasize about this, that the IGH heavy chain is the really important thing about all lymphomas. The idea here is that a lot of the translocations that happen in lymphoma will be to involve the heavy chain here. So as Moses was indicating, basically all cancers are going to be a problem of either turning on oncogenes or turning off tumor suppressor genes. Either way, we're either removing the brakes or we're stepping on the gas. Now, What's going to happen with a lot of these lymphomas, which is why you're going to see these translocations pop up so much, is that B cells in the lymph nodes have one job mainly, which is to make IgG, IgH immunoglobulins. Now, if you were to slot in a oncogene that's designed to tell the cell to proliferate, instead of having IgH on that chromosome, now you're just gonna make C-MYC like it's your job. And now you're gonna proliferate forever. And so that's why anytime you see a lymphoma translocation, it usually is gonna involve chromosome 14 because that's where the IgH heavy chain is located. That's the machinery that's always on in B cells. And so if you slot in an oncogene there, you can really get going on making that oncogene all the time. So, that's going to be the case for other lymphomas that we're going to run into. In particular, we have already mentioned diffuse large B cell lymphoma, which is commonly going to be abbreviated DLBL or DLBCL. And when we see this one, we usually see a lot of BCL2, BCL6. Specifically, BCL2 is going to be involved in anti-apoptosis. And if you have overexpression of BCL2, you're telling the cell to never undergo apoptotic death which means it now has become more or less immortal, which means that it will have a proliferative advantage over its neighbors and just grow continuously. The main things to point out about uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma though, is predominantly that it is the thing that Richter's transformation causes, meaning that we have a leukemia that turns into a lymphoma. It's often gonna be DLBCL. It's also bimodal, but really they're gonna ask you about BCL2, BCL6. And so typically, well, you could be able to identify this on an image. I'm gonna point out that the likelihood of them asking you like an image-based question about DLBCL is pretty low, to be honest. And instead, they're probably just gonna emphasize that this one has a really high uh, kind of like translation and uh, production of BCL2 and BCL6. Anything to add about DLBCL though, Moses? No, that was really beautifully stated. Cool. All right. Let's go ahead and bring it over to another lymphoma. So on to mantle cell lymphoma. I will start off by saying that even amongst the hemonc malignancies, I don't have a lot of love for mantle cell lymphoma. And honestly, neither does the USMLE. The key thing to remember here, I'm going to cut straight to the chase, is the translocation, right? It's going to be um, either 1114 that's being tested or the genes that are on those different chromosomes that then drive the pathogenesis of the lymphoma. And specifically here, we're talking about cyclin D1 and IDH. 
Now, this actually gives me a, a perfect opportunity because uh, this, this question has come up in the chat and you know, uh, Joe and I have been talking about it too, is, is the issue of CD5. So for, first of all, let me preface this by saying super minor point, not, not that clinically important. It turns out that CD5 is found on both T cells and B cells, depending on which disease you're talking about, a minor population of B cells, but also seen in some T cell lymphomas. I don't want that to be a point of confusion moving forward, but I want to emphasize that it's also not terribly important, but I bring it up just because in first aid, you will see that in some of these lymphomas, even if they're B cell, they'll have CD5, and then they'll also be T cells uh, lymphomas that have CD5. I'm going to jump in too, and I'm going to say that the, the rare Moses versus Joe debate is occurring right now. Uh, Moses is correct, but he's the worst kind of correct, which is knowing too much. And that is dangerous for step one, step two, complex students, because if you know too much, it can sometimes really interfere with the simple questions they're going to ask you on the exam. Moses is coming at this from a clinician standpoint where CD5 absolutely is represented on certain B cell malignancies. However, CD5 is typically going to show up on regular style T cells. Now, if step one or complex level one is going to ask you a question about that involves CD5 in any way, shape, or form, they're giving you the bread and butter like T cells are supposed to be using this. And from that perspective, I say that if you ever see CD5 on this exam, they're likely talking about T cell ALL specifically, showing you that this is a T cell lineage. Could you end up seeing it in mantle cell lymphoma? Could you see it in CLL? Yes, you can. Is that going to show up on step one or the complex at all? I don't think so. So for the purposes of looking at mantle cell lymphoma specifically, I would say probably don't need that for the exam, but Moses was absolutely correct. You can see CD5 a lot of places. So my simplistic description of CD5 being sandwiched between CD4 and CD8 is correct as far as you need to know for any tests you will take before you graduate medical school. Now, if you're going to become a hematologist oncologist, take some of this stuff I say with a grain of salt, because I'm trying to teach you guys towards the complex and do assembly right now. So sorry for the confusion there for us talking across purposes. It doesn't happen too often, but Moses. Uh, In all Moses, things, just listen to Joe. I get too excited. He knows more <laughs> than I do. So he sometimes uh, teaches me things as we're going. So sorry to interrupt you there, Moses. Anything else to say about mental cell before we move on? Honestly, no. Just know the translocation. Excellent. All right. So finally, on to follicular lymphoma, really commonly asked about on the exam. I would point out that as far as the lymphomas go, like if there are two that you're going to know for the test, probably follicular lymphoma and Burkitt's lymphoma are the ones that come up the most, uh, which is going to be really frustrating because it's hard to remember their translocations next to each other. But for follicular lymphoma, the basic idea is this. You look at the image and you see a lot of follicles. So a lot of germinal centers that are rapidly expanding here when we're looking at the lymph node, you should not see that many circles when you look at a typical lymph node. And so if you see that on biopsy, you do need to recognize this. So you got to know the starry sky appearance for Burkitt's. You got to know the follicular appearance for follicular lymphoma. Now, as far as the clinical aspect goes here, they are fond on the exam of follicular lymphoma because it will be a person of middle age or relatively young age coming in, young adult age that is, coming in complaining of a large lymph node. And you palpate a two centimeter lymph node and say, come on back in a little bit, let's see what it looks like. And then it just kind of over the course of the next year, kind of waxes and wanes. Doesn't really get too much bigger, but doesn't really shrink down to a normal size lymph node either. The waxing and waning bigger, smaller lymph node is usually what you're going to see clinically for this one, which can help you to specify what kind of lymphoma it is. You kind of think it is lymphoma because by definition, lymphoma means a large lymph node, essentially. And the waxing waning presentation kind of gives you the answer sometimes clinically. On the other hand, if they straight up tell you that you have a 1418 translocation, then you know you're looking at follicular lymphoma. If they give you the image, you know. So uh, as far as uh, the gene here that we're translocating, it is, again, BCL2 for follicular lymphoma. So it's unfortunate that it overlaps a little bit with what we saw before with the DLBCL, but that's the one that is going to be affected for follicular in the same way that CMYC was the one that was affected specifically that we saw before with Burkitt's. So uh, anything to add about follicular lymphoma, Moses, before we move on from here? No, that's perfect. All righty. So uh, now on to marginal lymphoma. Yeah, this is another one of those lymphomas where um, the 
there's essentially two key things to know. The first is that it can arise in the in this in a setting of chronic inflammation. So inflammation like an autoimmune disease, the one that's classically taught is like Sjogren's, um, or uh, in the GI tract, for instance, in the setting of gastritis. Thankfully, if you remove the inflammation, often that actually helps you treat the lymphoma, not something that's tested, but um, an interesting little tidbit. Just like the other lymphomas, where this is gonna be tested is really in the translocation, right? They'll either give you the translocation and say, which lymphoma is this? Or they'll straight up tell you what the diagnosis is. They tell you this is marginal lymphoma. And then you will be, uh, then link that to the basic science, right? Um, it is a T1118. Again, those genes involved are cyclin D1 and, and BCL2. Um, you will not be able to diagnose this likely just from a path image. It's, this is not like Hodgkin's lymphoma where you have this very classic pathognomonic feature. There's two ways to test this, give you the diagnosis and test the translocation or the other way around. Anything to add there, Joe? No, I don't think so. I think uh, this one is probably one of my least favorite when it comes to like teaching because this one really doesn't have much to grab onto other than you might see it as sequelae of other autoimmune diseases. But as a lymphoma, it's kind of frustrating. It doesn't have my favorite thing about them, which is chromosome 14 translocations, and that kind of breaks the entire narrative. So I'll point out that usually I would look at this one as being in a question about a person who clearly has autoimmune disease, and that's probably the best way that you can angle your approach to saying that it's marginal lymphoma. Not a, not a very fun one on the exam, unfortunately. Uh, one that is flavorful, though, and one that is different than the others is going to be T-cell lymphoma. So everything we talked about so far was either B cell lymphoma as a Hodgkin's lymphoma or as a non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Within non Hodgkin's, we had Burkitt's and marginal and mantle cell and DLBCL and follicular. Now, not even looking at B cells, now we're looking at T cells, which honestly isn't the most commonly tested thing. But when they ask about T cell lymphoma, you have to be able to recognize it. And it's basically lymphoma plus skin lesions, occasionally bone lesions as well, but basically some kind of skin discoloration, skin changes that you see in conjunction with what we would have seen with lymphoma otherwise, that kind of gives you your answer for T cell lymphoma. The thing that they're likely to ask about is like, why did this happen? And there's a specific virus that's associated with this, HTLV, which is going to be a retrovirus that specifically affects T cells. Retrovirus is pretty good at affecting T cells. So you can kind of think of it in the same category technically as like HIV, for instance. But what we're gonna see in these individuals is that skin lesion, that skin rash, in addition to uh, having maybe CD markers of T cells or something along those lines. But the main idea that we're looking at here is that T cell lymphoma doesn't have any of the other stuff that we were going to see with the other lymphoma. So we don't have a characteristic biopsy picture that's going to be very obvious from the lymph nodes, and we don't have a translocation that helps us very much. So the only thing we can really lean on is the fact that they have these weird extra lymphatic symptoms, spe specifically referring to the bone and skin stuff that we're going to see there. There is a geographical predominance for this, uh, given the infectious disease nature of this condition. Uh, so you will find it in certain subpopulations, uh, which can help us on the exam, but aren't going to be locked in stone. So we're not necessarily going to inc incorporate it on there. Uh, so uh, anything to add about T cell lymphomas, Moses? Honestly, no. But I think keeping that uh, association between T cells and skin is a, a sort of related set of diseases, mycosis fungoides or the Cesare syndrome, where you can end up seeing again, skin involvement, skin patches and plaques. Um, the Cesare component comes in when you have progression to leukemia. So these cells are, are in the blood. Um, the things, the, the buzzwords that might come up are these intrapodermal or potrier uh, microabscesses. And then you have um, on the heme path side, CD4 positive cells with what's described as a cerebriform nuclei. Uh, you may or may not be able to appreciate it here. You know, sometimes pathologists go a little, a little overboard with their food and other uh, associations in terms of naming their processes. But, you know, if you squint hard enough, you might be convinced yourself that uh, you have like the two cerebral lobes here within um, the, the leukemic uh, slash lymphomic cell here. Um, this is one of those examples, by the way, where I said that, you know, there's a lymphoma component and there's also a leukemic component. Sometimes you see them both as the disease progresses. The image on the bottom right is just the uh, skin biopsy that is chock full of these uh, uh, neoplastic uh, cells from the mycosis fungoides.
All right. So to summarize some of the stuff that we looked at so far with the translocations, just want to emphasize that as far as like the hematology oncology translocations that matter, uh, I'm not going to necessarily make a case for the entire US Emilian complex exam. Let's focus in on leukemias, lymphomas. The translocations that matter are going to be the translocations that involve chromosome 14, 8, 11, 18, 15, and 17. Now, this is a lot to take in at once, but just keep in mind, uh, if you're looking at somebody who has a 15, 17 translocation, you know that you're looking at a PML. If you have somebody who has like a 14, 18 translocation, you know you're looking at like follicular lymphoma. So pretty much all of the lymphomas mostly uh, are going to involve that chromosome 14. So 14, 8, 14, 14, 18, 11, 14, those are all going to be lymphomas. Meanwhile, the 15, 17 translocation is going to be the one involved with the AML. I'll throw in there that 922 is another translocation that we'll see with the CML. That's probably the only one that we don't have listed here that's super testable. So we can limit our focus, right? As you guys are studying for this stuff and like, what do I need to memorize? Like what's important here? It really just comes down to these ones that we have on the screen now. And then I would add in probably the one that we have for CML. I'll point out too, just for later, uh, there's a really nice uh, chart that lists all of these necessary translocations in first aid. Um, forgive me for not knowing the page number off the top of my head, but you look in the hematology oncology chapter, you should pretty easily find the one that just specifically lists the translocations. That is a summative list of the stuff that you need to know for lymphomas, leukemias. So with that, hopefully uh, our kind of like rapid fire review of these leukemias and lymphomas was somewhat comprehensible for you guys. I know this is a really difficult subject theory to get a lot of information very quickly, but hopefully some of the rules that we laid down were helpful there. As we move forward here, uh, Moses and I are gonna stick around for a few minutes to answer any questions you guys might have. So if there's any questions on your mind, feel free to go ahead and start typing those into the chat box here. Also, if you guys wouldn't mind taking a look at our survey, just to kind of give us an idea of what worked and what didn't work this evening, we'd love to hear your feedback. While you guys are uh, generating any questions you might have for us about anything we talked about tonight, I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about med school tutors, and then we'll get into answering your questions before we wrap up for the evening. So um, med school tutors predominantly is known as a one-to-one -one tutoring company that helps to pair pre-med, medical students, residents, with very knowledgeable individuals who have taken these exams. Uh, big emphasis on step one clinical exams, preclinical exams, step two, stuff in medical school, but we also do expand beyond medical school to some degree. And importantly, uh, while what we're doing mainly is working with students to help them learn the material as tutors, really fundamentally, we are working as mentors for students to help them learn the best way they can learn, develop study schedules, strategies with them, select resources, and develop a longitudinal relationship where we can help a student do everything they can to become the best medical student, resident, clinician, what have you. We usually work with students for specific exams, but I develop really long-term relationships with students that I work with, and sometimes we'll hear back from them months and even years later when they're matching into residency, and so it's really fun to maintain a connection during that time frame to provide supplies, advice, and support to them. So if you're looking for somebody who you can, you can basically use as a mentor to help you get through medical school and kind of like share in that journey. You need or want somebody to come in and help you to organize yourself as you're working on these exams. We might be a good place for you guys to take a look at. And also though, you know, if you're not ready to necessarily find somebody like soul bond with and develop a long-term relationship, you can also reach out to us just for one-time planning sessions or just to kind of dip your toes in and get a sense of what we might provide if there's a specific exam or problem that you're trying to work on. Uh, we do one-time strategic planning sessions uh, we also offer some kind of like group training courses from time to time. So if you guys have any interest in meeting with someone like Moses and myself uh, to work with us in a kind of longer term capacity, feel free to reach out to med school tutors. I've included our communication information on the slide here uh, with the email, phone, and website. So take a look at us if we can help you guys to achieve your goals on whatever exam you guys are working on when it comes to med school. Uh, so now that I got that out of the way, we can answer any questions you guys have. Uh, Moses, have you noticed anything while I've been chatting here about uh, any of the clinical stuff we've been talking about tonight? Not yet. Folks, don't be shy. Um, <laughs> really, really appreciate all, all of the kind messages coming through in the chat. I'll just piggyback off of what uh, Joe was saying as we wait for any questions that, that might come through um, and say that, you know, uh, it's one thing to have uh, the right uh, materials, and we can definitely help in selecting the right materials for whatever examination uh, you might be preparing for, but it's often so much more than that in terms of how you use uh, 
the the resources geared towards how you learn the pace at which you learn having an accountability partner um, having someone cheerlead for you um, this can be an incredibly uh, stressful part of medical training something that we get past to get to what we really want to do which is often patient care or advocacy or any of the other things that uh, brought us to the profession in the first place and we are just uh, happy to connect you um, and, and be uh, a help as you sort of move through these stepping stones. Um, I'm not seeing any questions uh, in the chat. I, I will chalk that up to Joe's uh, phenomenal uh, explanations and corrections when I, when I went a little overboard with my Hemonk uh, knowledge and love. Um, I couldn't have asked for a better co-host. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I got to point out that uh... As far as, you know, thanks for sticking with us this evening, by the way, everybody, and uh, listen to us kind of talk on about a relatively difficult concept on the exam. I want to emphasize that if this stuff seems really stressful, that's kind of okay. Uh, at this point, knowing all of this stuff about this very complicated subject matter is really hard to do. And to example that, uh, I always learn things as I'm doing these with Moses. There are individual facts and little things that I didn't know that I'm learning as we're going through this. And if Moses and I have gone through this stuff a million times and trained tons of other students and done well on our exams and all that stuff, and we're still able to learn stuff uh, afterwards, it kind of indicates that a full knowledge of everything on the exam is very difficult to acquire. And so I just want to emphasize to you guys, if there's anything that really didn't feel like it made total sense to you guys, apologies in advance for that. But also, it's really hard to know everything. And your goal when you're preparing for the Comlux, USMLE, step one, step two, level one, level two, it's not that perfect knowledge of everything. So know as much as you can. And so don't be too hard on yourselves. Learn what you can, work hard, but at the same time, you're going to be growing as physicians the entire time that you act as clinicians. And so you should anticipate that, you know, learning is going to be a lifelong process. At least for me, it is, especially when I'm working with Moses. He teaches me a lot. Beautifully said and, and totally reciprocated. Thanks, man. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for meeting with us this evening. We really appreciate you guys hanging in there uh, for the long haul as we went through this really complicated stuff. Uh, I'll wrap up this evening by saying, uh, best of luck as you prepare for your exams. We really hope you guys achieve all of your goals. Please feel free to reach out to med school tutors if we can help at all. Otherwise, uh, Moses and myself will wish you the best of luck on these exams and then eventually on the wards, and we'll hope to see you in our next webinar. Uh, so have a great evening, and we'll see you guys 